what's up, partners? You are listening to the Horse Facts Podcast. Welcome, welcome, and yeah, thanks for riding along with us. This is episode 98. If this is your first episode, go back and listen from the beginning. Otherwise, let's saddle up and get on out there into that bright yonder of equine trivia. So you on down the trail. <laughs> the phrase, getting back on the horse, derives from the old adage, you have to get back on the horse that threw you. The phrase suggests that one should return to a challenging action after a failure and attempt it over. In this scenario, the horse here is standing in as a metaphor for your life. Yes, you have been rejected by your life in some way, but don't be discouraged. You can try again. You should try again. One must always try again one thing that we can all agree on you and your horse should never be separated horses are a prey animal in order for a horse to survive a horse is biologically programmed to seek the intentions of all those within its proximity the horse is constantly asking the question am I safe what about now Am I safe now? And so on. To answer this question, the horse must have an incredible aptitude for environmental observation, what we would call intuition. Have you ever heard someone say, I am afraid of this horse. And somehow I think, I think it knows I am. A horse can read your posture, your behavior, your respiration, even your adrenaline levels. Imagine a set of enormous invisible antenna protruding from the head of the horse long invisible fingers stretching deep into your brain deep into your thoughts what a hilarious image you've just imagined and yet in a way it is true number three Mounting and controlling a horse has always been a potent symbol of power. The horse rider, of course, is elevated, not to mention faster and more dangerous than their pedestrian counterpart. Nature is both mankind's primary resource, but also its hereditary threat, controlling a wild beast an avatar of nature, therefore shows mastery over nature. The horse becoming an extension of human will. Of course, this power dynamic can also be reversed. In the Western film genre, a character being dragged by their own horse was more than just an embarrassing piece of slapstick. It was the ultimate humiliation. Usually in a film, a horse dragging occurs when a character has revealed their weakness, whether cowardice or fear. Remember, horses smell fear. Having revealed this weakness, said weakness is immediately exploited by the horse. The natural world reasserts its dominance. The horse becomes the rider and the rider becomes the horse. The coward is dragged off by their foot into the forest, eaten by the landscape. You will hang for what you've done to obey. Step back and shut up. Usually, within the context of the film, these characters are never seen again. Number five. In his dialogue, Phaedrus, Plato describes the human soul as a chariot pulled by two horses. One horse is white, representing the uh, rational, positive parts of our passionate human nature. The other horse is black, representing the soul's irrational passions and appetites. 
The charioteer themselves represents intellect, reason, forever trying to stop their horses from going in different directions, steering both towards enlightenment. Plato's Phaedrus, with its complex souls of light and dark, with its belief in an ever-shifting reality, a reality as knowable as a horse, which, according to Plato, was pretty inscrutable. Phaedrus would have made for a pretty weird western. Every cowboy forced to ride two horses simultaneously, the white and black hats now on the horses, not their owners. Phaedrus the Western would be 99% dragging, I suspect, with only the briefest moment, say a minute, when a character manages to actually ride. A brief flash of clarity, and back into the dust. Number six. As long as there has been horse racing, there has been horse doping. Trainers have experimented with Viagra, energizing opioids, drugs that dilate airways, unlicensed concoctions such as Blue Magic, thought to boost cardiovascular function, even EPO, the hormone made famous by Lance Armstrong. A hundred years ago, trainers had to make do with street narcotics like morphine and heroin. Low doses of heroin were supposed to make a horse less skittish for a race. In 1933, track president Joe Widener of the Flamingo Derby tried to ban doping through a horse saliva test. He gathered together 150 horse owners and trainers. Gentlemen, he told them, training is no longer a matter of skill. It has simply become a question of formula. The remark was met by laughter because it was true. The use of heroin in horse doping may be the reason why horse is one of the many street names for the drug. Heroin addicts became closely associated with the racetracks. Some would serve as heroin testers, checking the purity of the heroin before it was given to the horses, wherever there were horses, there were drugs. Number seven. I was once thrown from a horse. Her name was Misty. I was 13 years old. It was a school trip to the Lake District. The rest of my classmates were all given ponies. They were small, cartoonish things. My best friend, Henri, was on a pony so small that his feet nearly touched the ground. Misty, however, was nearly twice my size. My eyeline was barely level with her anus. The woman who ran the, uh, I guess it was an equestrian center, I remember she was in her 70s. She thought that I was a girl, which meant I kept tuning out of her instructions. The old lady was saying things like, that girl needs to tighten up her reins a bit, and that girl up front needs to stop looking around like that. I remember thinking, whoever this girl is, she's going to get herself killed. Soon after, I was lying winded on my back, Misty kicking her hind shoes inches from my soft 13-year-old head. The old lady shouted, Now you've done it, whether to the horse or to me. I'm still unsure. After that, I did not ride Misty again. I did not get back on the horse. My teacher... Mr. Bibby rode Misty instead, and I went back inside. Later, my classmates told me that a mere five minutes after my accident, Misty had broken line once more, this time charging full pelt into thick forestation. Mr. Bibby held on for dear life, 
despite colliding with several tree branches. Mr. Bibby refused to give up, just as Mr. Bibby had refused to give up time and time again throughout our education. Mr. Bibby always remained true to his number one passion, throwing sticks of chalk at students whenever they failed a maths question. No matter how many times Mr. Bibby was challenged, this was a man who would not yield. Neither horse nor parent-teacher association could dislodge him. There is a proverb from a Hibernian sage that says, there are three things a man never forgets. The girl of his early youth, a devoted teacher, and a great horse. It pleases me that this anecdote contains all three. Having covered all three bases so efficiently, I doubt I ever need recall anything else. Number eight. <laughs> Trojan is the worst possible name for a condom company. I am sure you agree. If my memory of ancient Greek technology serves me correctly, the primary function of the Trojan horse was once it had passed safely through the gates of the enemy, the primary function of the Trojan horse was to spill out hundreds and hundreds of little people with swords. I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to practice safe sex, that is literally the last thing I want to happen. Number nine. Horses are uncomfortable in the middle and dangerous at both ends. This quote attributed to Ian Fleming, novelist and naval intelligence officer who died aged 56 of a heart attack. One could easily apply Fleming's model of a horse to other objects. Many things are dangerous at the ends and uncomfortable in the middle. A cigar, nunchucks, the Daytona International Speedway. One could even apply Fleming's horse model to a human life as a whole, i.e. mostly uncomfortable with a highly vulnerable entrance and exit. Here we see the horse represented as timeline, our life as a creature that we pass through from one end to the other, a horse called reality that slowly absorbs us until all that remains is waste product. I don't know, something to think about. <laughs> A dream. You are running down the middle of an empty street. It is the start of the Second World War. There are no street lights, no lit shop windows. The houses that line the road are black and silent. You run past the cinema, now boarded up. Someone has arranged the marquee lettering outside the cinema to read Oh well, never mind. Even running past at speed, you appreciate the gesture, which feels instinctively to be the most palatable mode of thought in wartime. The songs are far too cheery, the newspapers far too sad, best to aim for a kind of bored middle ground. To begin with, in the dream, you do not know where you are supposed to be running to. All you know is that it is extremely urgent. Then you turn the corner and see the town bank ahead of you. The clock face above the bank reads one minute to four and immediately you know your purpose. Bursting through the door of the bank, you pull out your savings book and thrust it into the hands of the teller. You tell the teller you need to close the account this minute. It is imperative that you leave the bank 
with every penny. Vitella regards the savings book upside down, removes their pince-nez, and shakes their head. No, says the teller. It is just not possible. But you must, you say. You have to. This second utterance rings the bank like a bell. Several customers stop in their tracks to look at you. A man holding a newspaper coughs pointedly. Vitella points to the back office. The manager, they say, has given explicit instructions to hold all account closures for the next three days. But you are already climbing over the counter, heading straight for the manager's door, ready to give them a piece of your mind. Above you, an alarm begins to ring. Stop, says a voice. You push open the manager's door into a large, white tiled room, like a bathhouse or a slaughter shed. The room is empty, except for the manager. Eyes shining like diamonds dipped in blood. The manager is a horse. Number 11. The word metaphor comes from the Greek metaphorian, which means to carry or to transport. To create a metaphor is ostensibly to transfer something from here to there. Take an example metaphor like my voice is a prison from which you will never escape. Now in this example here, like all metaphors, there are two parts at play. My voice and a prison. And the metaphor acts as a shuttle service between these two concepts. The journey begins at my voice and then through the metaphor you are carried a great distance until eventually you reach the prison. Real life long distance transportation comes in many shapes and forms but before cars or trucks or container ships it all began with the horse. A living, breathing technology designed to transport objects across great distances. Thus, the concept of the horse and the concept of the metaphor have always been intertwined. Horses bring messages from far off lands, riders coming over the hill, clutching news. You may or may not be happy to hear. Number 12. Horses not only transport messages, but they are messages in themselves. Horses are walking metaphors. The literary potential of the horse has proven endless. Think of the social novels of the 19th century with their themes of illegitimate love and broken marriage, where the horses stand in for the things that cannot be spoken aloud. When Tolstoy writes the steeplechase scene in Anna Karenina, when Vronsky, overexcited, rides his horse frou-frou so hard that he breaks its back. We know that this is not just the death of a horse, but the portent of something else. Something that will take a hundred pages of the novel to appear, but still is set in motion from this moment. The horse is the living metaphor of love and death. This is why Polish philosopher and historian Krzysztof Pomein describes the horse not only as a foros, a carrier of something, but also a semiphoros, a semaphore, a carrier of signs. So, with that in mind, how much do you know about this horse? This horse, the horse transporting you right this moment. Do you know where this horse is taking you? Do you have any idea what this horse represents? No, I didn't think so. Number 13. The degree to which 
Horses can read us, rivals the greatest human fortune tellers and mentalists of all time. The slightest human tell is apparent to a horse. A tiny movement, a change of posture, a slight tightening of the vocal cords. Hence, the astonishing ability of clever hands, the famous counting horse. Whenever a sum was proposed to the horse, Hans would tap his foot the appropriate number of times and then stop. Of course, Hans was never actually completing arithmetic. He was actually responding to minute postural changes in his trainer. Hans became so good at reading human signals that the trick worked even when the trainer left the room and someone else took over. When the correct number of taps were reached, the stranger could not help but tense his body slightly. The horse would read the sign and stop. You could try to trick the horse, maybe shout, That's enough! You got it! to try and make him stop early. But the ruse would not work. Clever hands was not listening to your words. He was listening to your body. You could not lie to clever hands. At least, not where the subject of counting was concerned. Number 14. You have probably noticed that I too am counting. Much like a horse tapping their hoof on the floor. Number 15. From this observation, you might ask yourself, am I too trying to solve a question? Just as clever hands counted out his answers, am I counting out an answer of my own? Number 16. Let us say for a second that I am a horse. And that, like clever hands, I have been tasked with solving a question of some kind. If this is true, then at some point, presumably, I shall stop counting. You shall know I have reached the correct answer at the precise moment I stop counting. The truth is the end. Once reached, there will be nothing more to say. Number 17. Here's a problem though. If I am a horse, and for the purposes of this thought experiment, I am a horse, then I don't actually understand the question at all. All I'm doing is looking at you and following your lead. If you don't tense when I reach the correct answer, I will literally count forever. You are the one who needs to answer the question. You are the only one who can answer the question. It's you who needs to tell me when I finally get it right. You might think you don't even know the answer, but you do. The body always knows. Every flinch, every twitch. You don't even know that you're talking to me, but I can hear you through that long, invisible antenna. I hear you. You're talking to me now. I can hear it. I know what you're thinking. You know you can't lie to me. Close, but still. I don't think we've reached the answer. And so, uh, I keep counting. Number 18. Did you know the phrase one horse town comes from the name of an actual place, a small town in Shasta County, California? One horse town was a regular stop for gold miners. Number 19. Did you know being told you are on a high horse used to be a compliment? Isn't that absolutely mental? Originally, only soldiers and royalty rode those 
tall war chargers. Therefore, being on your high horse meant behaving in a regal fashion, which used to be seen as a good thing until we lost all respect for the monarchy and started executing them all. Did you know, in Robert Smith Surtees' 1853 novel, Mr. Sponge's Sporting Tour, the novelist remarks that there is no secret so close as that between a rider and his horse. I mean, I haven't read the novel, so who knows what the fuck it means in the context of the story. I mean, I know it's something to do with fox hunting and scaring the upper classes, but would you want a fucking book report? Number 21. Did you know horses live a really long time? 25 to 30 years, actually. The oldest horse in the world was called Billy, later renamed Old Billy. He was a barge horse born in 1760. Old Billy lived 62 years. Just think about how many horse facts you could learn if you're forced to listen to them non-stop for 62 years. Averaging a new horse fact every minute, you'd learn 32.5 million horse facts. 62 years before the nightmare finally came to an end. Can you imagine that? You would welcome death. Death. A rather obvious answer to a question you hadn't even realised you'd asked. For the record, I will accept death as an answer. But it's not the answer I'm looking for. Number 22. Did you know the phrase, beating a dead horse, goes back to the 1640s? Sailors were often paid in advance for work. The problem was, they took the money and immediately got off their face. After that, there was little motivation to complete the tasks that they'd been paid for. This period of work became known as dead horse time. The men became dead horses, horse parts, pickled in alcohol, flung around the dockyard. The logic, therefore, must be this. Kick a live horse and you can get more work out of it. Kick a dead horse, you get nothing. You can't fight a dead horse and win. The dead horse is a black hole. Just watch it can see. What do you remember? How did you get here? Remember the horses smell fear. Remember that you must get back on your horse. Remember that you cannot lie. Are you safe? What about now? Are you safe now? What about now, 24? Perhaps the most intriguing image in the New Testament's only book of prophecy is that of the four horsemen, white, red, black, and pale. Taken as a whole, the four horsemen stand as judgment upon mankind. They descend upon humanity at the direct command of Christ the Judge, and he gives them free reign, get it, reign, to do their worst upon the earth's inhabitants. According to Revelation 6-8, the four horsemen kill up to a quarter of the planet's population. In today's terms, that comes to about a billion and a half people. Try to think about that number. Except you can't. You fundamentally lack the mental capacity to even begin to imagine something on that scale. I mean, that's not like trying to imagine an abstract concept, like funky or gorgeousness. It's a real actual number, and yet it still exists so far beyond the horizon of your perception that it becomes absolutely meaningless. Try to imagine a billion and a half horse fans. What if there were a billion and a half horse fans? You will literally think and begin. Congratulations. You have now reached the halfway point of your first session. Please raise your hand clear above your head. 
One of our centre specialists will be over in a second to give you your first chip. Keep your hand raised until the specialist arrives. Do not remove your blindfold. Do not try to sit up. Remember, you are surrounded on all sides by carefully calibrated equipment. When the centre specialist puts the chip into your hand, close your fist, lower your arm and place the chip in your pocket. Try not to have an emotional reaction to the chip. Smiling may cause an unexpected reading in the equipment. Nevertheless, you should be proud of yourself for completing the first half of the first session of your treatment. This is the first step to wellness and recovery. With each step, you are stronger. With each step, you are more resilient to temptation. Picture yourself strong and powerful, like a statue carved in marble. Soon, this will be you. You only have 149 more steps to go. Please do not react to this exciting information. The equipment that surrounds you is trained to record the slightest emotional reaction. It is important that you do not react to provocation, as the machine does not differentiate between positive and negative reactions. Repeat after me. I will not let myself be ruled by my base instincts. The monster within me will not win. The monster within me will not win. Well done. Please stand by for the commencement of Session 1, Part 2, Gordon Ramsay's History of Burglar Alarms. Imagine, 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 the vines, 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 Thanks to Lizzie Denning for providing the additional voice in that first piece. Um, I'd also like to thank a couple of resources too. There's an essay film by Jack Nugent, a.k.a. Now You See It, called What Riding a Horse Really Means. You can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Also, the book Farewell to the Horse, A Cultural History by Ulrich Ralph. Uh, I'm indebted to both those sources. Thanks also to you for listening to the Imaginary Advice podcast. My name is Ross Sutherland. Give me a high five. Okay, now on the side. Now up top. And uh, we're not going to do that final trick part because I don't believe in hurting people's feelings. Um, in a minute, uh, we're going to round off this episode with, uh, with a live recording, uh, something I recorded with an um, improvisational jazz band earlier this month in London. Uh, before we get to that, though, let me just uh, say a quick thanks to uh, my Patreon supporters. Thank you to you for uh, helping make this show possible. I love making imaginary advice. It's uh, it's it's pretty much my favourite thing to do in the world. But um, because every episode takes uh, weeks to write because I, I write and edit and record it all myself. Uh, I'm still yet to manage to balance the books. One day, I um, I hope to get to a point where I can pay myself for my time and, uh, and through patron support, um, I'm getting there. So uh, if you're interested, it's basically a small monthly donation to help me keep the lights on. Um, earlier this month, I uploaded a bunch of patron-only material to the patron website. Uh, for those people who donate $5 a month or more, I made a three-part mini-series 
about the 2011 England riots. There's also a story from Joe Dunthorne in there. Also, I, I try and go through some of the process uh, that, that goes into making an episode of Imaginary Vice. So if you're interested in like the back end of this show at all, then uh, there's some stuff on that. Here's a little extract from it now. Also, um, for people who donate $15 a month or more, I've just released uh, a new film, uh, which is also up on the Patreon website. Uh, it's a work in progress of an audio guide for a London train line. Uh, the idea being that you will eventually be able to sit on that train, hit play, and have me narrate the journey through a kind of mixture of, kind of poetry, history, and stories, and anecdotes. Uh, the train line in question is the District Light Railway, which uh, connects the two financial districts of London, plus uh, it moves through areas associated with alchemy, and piracy, opium addiction, and uh, and the bassist from Public Image Limited. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, that's also on the Patreon website. There's a little bit from that. If you don't yet support the show, but would like to, if you sign up now, you can still get access to all that material. Um, if you'd like to help the show, but you can't spare any money, which I totally understand, uh, uh, you can still help the show, if you'd like, by um, leaving a review on iTunes or by talking about the show online. All that makes a, uh, a huge difference to me. Uh, it really helps spread the word. And uh, th thanks to everyone who's ever done that in the past uh, I'm really grateful so anyway now into the final section of uh, of, of this month's episode uh, this piece was recorded at a night in London called Tong Fu uh, which is one of my favourite places to perform in London Tong Fu has a live band on stage uh, each guest gets to work with the band you don't get to prepare anything beforehand uh, you just go on and you can work out in the moment. Uh, the band are incredible. Uh, the night is fantastic. Go to tongfu.co.uk to find out when the next event is. Their London base is uh, usually Rich Mix Cinema in the East End. Okay, well, uh, that's that's all from me. I think I'll, I'll hand over to me. Uh, one day I was in uh, a pub in Liverpool with uh, my friend uh, Tom Brooks and uh, Tom and I came up with a, a, an idea for a new, uh, a, a new genre of poetry, a new form of poetry, um, which we called uh, brochism. And the idea behind brochism was to take like, a, a quality normally associated with bad poetry and uh, exaggerate it to a point that it, it, it becomes something else. Now, that, that the bad quality in general was kind of like over-laboring adjectives. Uh, you know, like my, my dark, feeble, uh, uh, haunted, empty heart. That kind of thing, right? So uh, we, would, we, we took that idea and then we just like cranked it up about another like 99%. And uh, this is the, the one poem that I ever wrote uh, in, in the style of brochism. It's about a horse. <laughs> are you, are you, you know horses. So, um, and that's really where the poem begins and ends. So, uh, I don't know if you fancy something a little bit horsey. And then as I describe the horse to you, maybe we can adapt the horse a little bit as it comes more into focus. Maybe the horse to begin with is very, very far away. I don't even know what it is. Oh. What? Oh. Here comes a horse. Here comes a horse. A tremendous, perfect horse. Look at it. 
sequined with rain Iridescent almost So noble Practically aristocracy Some deep air to the throne no doubt Here it comes Here comes a horse A financially comfortable horse Oh yeah It's so generous And approachable Not even a little bit ticklish So fucking unflappable Almost suspicious Here comes the horse My god is she She is Bespectacled Bearded Slightly Russian looking Professional Yes, very much incognito, but without doubt, the horse. A Machiavellian horse. Yeah, that is pretty Machiavellian, I agree. Yes. Slightly clumsy. Yes. Over exaggerated for comic effect. Some might even describe it as Chaplin esque. Here comes a horse! A pissed horse! Oh my god, it's fucking paralytic! so scary. The horse is so sporty. The horse is so... The horse is so posh. The horse is so ginger. The horse is so... The other one. Here comes a horse. Yes. A junglist horse. A little bit speckly. A little bit scaggy. But, uh, really fucking good. Here comes a horse! A horsey horse! There's something in this beautiful Oh my god, no, 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 oh my god. What a sad, but perfectly poetic development. <laughs> well, there goes a horse. A beautiful, grey haired, 39 year old, badly shaven horse. Still quite attractive in a trampy kind of way. But cheeky. But you know, knows their shortcomings, so it's so it's alright really. That's gotta count for something. There goes a horse. A very clever metaphorical horse. <laughs> Dead in a field. 
with flies in his visage. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me. Uh, cheers, thank you very much. Enjoy your uh, next to your night. Ross Southern! Riding off! Riding off into the sunset!